10.09 p.m. I asked Dad to let Abby sleep in my room. He yawned. Fine. Fact. The best time to ask your parents for something is when they're really tired. I hopped into bed and picked up my copy of Thank Goodness, my favorite book of all time. Did I mention that already? Anyway, Thank Goodness is the first book in the Jonah Forrester series. The one where Jonah discovers he's a vampire. But Jonah decides to use his powers for good, so he becomes a policeman in Los Angeles, where no one knows his true identity. I was rereading the part where he goes to a Los Angeles Dodgers game and saves everyone by biting a bad guy who was about to fill the concession stands with poisonous hot dogs. Jonah Forrester is awesome. Vampires are awesome. I think the last thing I thought before falling asleep was, I hope I meet a vampire one day. Sometime after 12 o'clock a.m. I remember dreaming about Jonah Forrester taking me out for ice cream and him ordering a strawberry milkshake. I remember hearing a whoosh like the wind and then a thwack like a door slam. I remember rubbing my eyes and looking around. I remember checking Abby's bed and realizing that she wasn't there. I remember noticing that the window was open. I remember looking out the window and seeing a small shape scurrying along the driveway. I remember thinking it was Abby, but then saying to myself, you're half asleep, you're probably just seeing things. I remember lying back down in my bed thinking about stuff, how I had a blotch on my face, how I got an awesome but strange dog, how I got a new babysitter, how dad might get a job, and I remember the last thing I said to myself before I fell back asleep. Boy, what a crazy day. I had no idea the craziness was just getting started. Part 2. The Bully Wednesday, August 27th, 8.33 a.m. Blotch Report Seems to have gotten worse overnight. Dad reports it now looks like North Dakota. I looked up North Dakota. It's the 17th biggest state in the country. Only 16 more to go. Oh, and tomorrow's the first day of school. Yay! As soon as I woke up, I checked Abby's bed. She wasn't there. But for but then, for some reason, I looked in the closet, and there she was, sleeping peacefully, buried in the dirty clothes I'd shoved in the corner. I suddenly had this random thought. Jonah Forrester sleeps in his closet. Hmm. I tried to wake Abby up, but she just looked at me, wagged her tail for a second, then went back to sleep. I looked over at the window. It was open. Slowly, the whole semi-dream thing came back to me. Did Abby really go out in the middle of the night like Jonah Forrester does? Okay, I thought to myself, that's enough of that. I headed downstairs for breakfast. Mom was already gone, as usual. Misty was still sleeping. She liked to sleep a lot during the summer. I couldn't wait to see her get up at 6.15 tomorrow for school. That was going to be fun. Meanwhile, Dad was looking at himself in the hall mirror, deciding which tie to wear for his big interview later that day. He tried on about 20 before settling on a blue one with purple flowers on it. What do you think, he asked me. I think it's totally spectacular, I answered. I think it's the best tie ever, and you'll not only get the job, but also get a raise and a promotion. I stood next to him in front of the mirror. Meanwhile, my blotch is also blue and purple, so we have that in common. Now come on, Dad said. Mom is bringing home some medicine. Mom is bringing some medicine home tonight, and that thing will be gone by morning. Just you wait. What is that gross smell, I said, changing the subject. Ah, uh, yes, said my dad. Those are Mrs. Craig's breakfast goodies. Let's go take a look. She's going to get you and me off all our sugary treats and onto a healthy diet. Isn't that great? No, it's the opposite of great. When we walked into the kitchen, I had to hold my nose. It smelled like old socks soaked in swamp juice. What is that? Boiled kelp, said my dad. Seaweed. Supposedly it's delicious and good for you. Fact. Nothing good for you tastes good. Everybody knows that. For breakfast, I moaned? Yeah, no. I headed to the cabinet to grab some super sugar flakies. Not today, Jimmy, said my dad. It's time to try something new. Wait a second. I'd been eating super sugar flakies ever since I found out that Jonah Forrester ate them to help convince people he wasn't a vampire. It was my morning routine. Dad, I eat super sugar flakies every day, I complained. So do you. Well, today we're changing things up. That stinks. Luckily, there were some muffins on the table, which I grabbed. So I grabbed one and took a bite. 
which I immediately almost threw up. Yuck, what's in that? Garlic, said my dad, which is also very healthy. I don't see a muffin on your plate. Already had one, he said, but I totally didn't believe him. Now dig in. Fine. As I tried to force it down, there was a noise behind me. I looked down and saw Abby sleepily wagging her tail. She took one step into the kitchen, saw me eating the garlic muffin, and immediately ran to the other end of the house. It's never a good sign when a dog runs away from food, I said. Just saying. My dad sighed. No super sugar flakies today, and that's final. As we sat there in silence and tried to eat breakfast, I realized it was stupid arguments like this that probably made him all excited about going back to work. 9.46 a.m. It took me about an hour to recover from breakfast. I think I brushed my teeth for 20 minutes, but I still couldn't get the taste out of my mouth. Fact, toothpaste is no match for garlic and kelp. Finally, I was ready to get on with my day. Erwin came over, and as usual, I made him watch Stop Police with me. It was the episode where Hank Barlow goes undercover as a race car driver to break up an international gold smuggling gang. He gets in a terrible accident and almost dies, but that's what I love about Hank. He has no fear. He'll do whatever it takes to fight crime. At the end of the episode, I stood up as Hank saluted his captain. Catching the bad guys isn't just my job, I said, along with Hank. It's my life. Erwin stared at me. You're a wacko, you know that? Takes one to know one, I said back. Not exactly original, I know, but it was all I could think of at the time. <clears throat> we were about to start a second episode when my dad hollered, That's enough television. Go outside now. He's nervous about his job interview, I explained to Erwin. That's why he's yelling. My mom does the exact same that does the same exact thing when I'm inside on a nice day, he answered. But she yells even louder. That's Erwin for you. He always has to top you at everything, even if it was about how mean parents could be. We went outside and spent five minutes blinking up into the bright sunlight, trying to figure out what to do. Let's go to the boathouse, Erwin suggested. Good idea. The boathouse was an old abandoned beach club about a mile away next to Nash's Swamp. It used to be called Nash's Pond, but over time it kind of dried up and turned into a swamp. No one ever went there anymore, so Irwin and I always had the place to ourselves. Dad, we're going to Nash's Swamp, I yelled. We'll be back in like an hour. I'm taking Abby. Are you sure you can handle it? He yelled back. Yep. Okay, great. Nothing makes parents more trusting of their kids than the prospect of getting them out of the house for a while. We went to find Abby, who'd gone back to sleep upstairs in my closet. She looked up at us with groggy eyes and finally agreed to get up, I think just to make me happy. Outside, Abby took one look at the sunlight and ran straight toward the crawl space beneath the house. Not today, Ab, we're taking a walk. Not today, Ab, I said, we're taking a walk. As I dragged her out from under the house, I remembered the guy at the rescue center who told me that she had some kind of eye condition that made her sensitive to light. But then I thought about all her other interesting qualities that made her unlike any other dog I'd ever seen. Like how tired she seemed during the day and how awake she seemed at night and how she saw the garlic muffins and ran the other way and the size of her fangs, especially the size of her fangs. 10.34 a.m. At the boathouse, Urban and I did what we always do, argued. Usually we argued about sports. I like baseball, Erwin like football, or girls. Which ones in our grade made us the most nervous, and why? Or who was better at Starfighters, our favorite video game? But this time, I brought up a new topic. There's something different about Abby, I told Erwin as I tied her to a tree in the shade so we could use the two tire swings. What do you mean? I'm not sure. She kind of reminds me of Jonah Forrester. Erwin looked at Abby, who had already fallen asleep, then rolled his eyes. Everything reminds you of Jonah Forrester. No, I'm serious, I said. For instance, she hates the light and sleeps all day. He looked at me. What's your point? My point is that I think she might be more than just a typical dog. Like how? I don't know yet. I hesitated, then decided to go for it. I think she might be a vampire. Erwin guffawed. You're being completely ridiculous. You're being completely ridiculous, I answered. That makes no sense. 
You make no sense. Cut it out. You cut it out. Hey, I never said 11-year-old boys were the greatest arguers in the world. After swinging got boring, we headed up to the roof deck where, the ch where there was a broken old hot tub and beach chairs and stuff. Last one up is a rotten egg, I hollered, racing up the stairs. Cheater, he yelled, you got a head start. After I got up to the roof, I started doing a victory dance. So what? I win. Suddenly, Irwin shouted, look out. I looked down. Yikes. There was this rotted plank of wood on the roof that you had to avoid next to the hot tub, and I'd almost stepped right on it. Jeez, I said, thanks. Fact. Friends are good to argue with, but they're even better to make sure you don't go crashing through the floor. You're welcome, Irwin said. I took a deep breath and looked around. The roof was cool because it made you feel like you were on top of the world. If the world was a dried up old swamp with two rusted out canoes tied to a broken dock. Irwin walked right to the edge of the roof and yelled, Hello out there! It's me, king of the world! Like he always did. I stayed far away from the edge because I was totally scared of heights and yelled, Some things are worth fighting for, but justice is worth fighting for! Like I always did. Stop quoting Hank Barlow, Irwin said. Duh, that's Jonah Forrester, I corrected him. Biting? Who cares, Irwin answered. I do, I said angrily, already forgetting that Irwin had basically saved my life 38 seconds earlier. I looked down and noticed that Abby, who had been napping under the tree, was now wide awake, looking up at me and jumping up and down. Look, I said to Irwin, she loves Jonah. Watch. I yelled again, some things are worth fighting for, but justice is worth biting for. And Abby started barking like crazy and jumping higher and higher. Her jumps were practically halfway up the tree. So what, Irwin said, now you're going to tell me she understands English? Maybe she just has to go to the bathroom. After a minute, Abby stopped jumping and let out about a two-minute yawn. I smacked Irwin on the shoulder. Come on, you got to admit, she's amazing, I said. No dog jumps that high, and no dog yawns, yawns for that long. That was a total vampire yawn. You know something, Irwin responded, I consider myself a pretty good friend. I watch Stop Please with you, and I let you tell me all about your... Jonah Forrester books, but I don't really want to listen to you talk about how Abby is some kind of Dracula dog, so do you mind not talking about it anymore? That's fair. Thank you. We were quiet for five seconds. You gotta admit, though, that was a pretty long yawn, I said. 11.18 a.m. On her way home, Abby nod on her leash. See, I said to Irwin, unable to help myself, she chews on everything. The teacher assignments are supposed to come today, Irwin said, completely ignoring me. Who cares, I answered, trying to ignore him back. I didn't want to talk about school because it just reminded me of my blotch and made me nervous. But Irwin was right. It was all about which teacher you got. I was hoping for Mrs. Sweetnam, who kept a jar of jelly beans on her desk at all times, and I was praying I wouldn't get Mr. Brinkmeyer, whose breath smelled like burning tires. I was trying to figure out a way to change the subject when we turned the corner and saw a bunch of kids playing kickball in the park. The first kid I recognized gave me a weird, nervous feeling in my stomach. Baxter Bradford. Profile. Baxter Bradford, age 11, but looks 14. Occupation, bully. Interests, picking on people not his own size.